I wanted to say something last, I think last week or the week before, I was out on the road with uh, Lawson and Matt and uh, Mike, and I will tell you this, this guy's as tough out there on the road as he is here, trust me, right? I came down with a bad case of food poisoning in uh, California, and I had to speak the next day at the branch, and I ate something there at the hotel as I was talking to two Churchill folks, and Man, within an hour, I was very, very sick, and I text Matt the next day and said, man, I'm, I, I, something's bad wrong, and I think he takes back, suck it up, we'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, suck it up, we'll move you back an hour. But I did. I gave you one. No, no, he did. He gave me an hour. He gave me a whole hour. <laughs> but, but, but no, listen, I did suck it up, and it was a great experience, and, I, and we were in uh, L.A., and we were in uh, or Anaheim, and then we went over to Phoenix, and man, it was good to see those people in person. And they all said the same thing, Coach, we thought you were a lot taller than you really than, than we see. It's a lot different than seeing it on here, right? But it's a great tree up. And listen, when you go out and see those branches, and it did my heart really, really good for them to know to have EOSs mm -hmm. and to to you know have even debate and dialogue about the EOS, about the best way to use it. And to, to just to just to see those people that don't always get to come here and know that what we're doing is working. And and yesterday I was with HBM and I said the same thing. I always brag on you when I go to HBM. I brag on your culture, I brag on, you know, everything about you, and I said it's so cool that every person has their own explanation of services, they can share that, and I can see it out in the branches around the country, so thank you for being coachable, right? Now, a few weeks ago, while I was in LA, I went to Malibu. Anybody ever been to Malibu? Malibu is a, about a 26-mile stretch of the beach there in, uh, in California. A lot of famous people live there. And I always had a dream of staying up in, a, in the mountains of Malibu and looking at the, at the ocean. Because we got the mountains in Tennessee, but we don't, we, we don't combine those two, right? And the woman, when I rented the house, said, are you afraid of heights? I was like, no, no. I was like, we got a mountain. We got a cabin in Gatlinburg. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she laughed, of course. And, uh, and so she was right. We had to go up and up and up and up. And literally, when you got up to the top of this mountain, you did not want to go back down. I mean, you wanted to literally just stay there for three days because it was really, it's like right off a cliff, right? But while I was there, I always study one thing. So I say, this trip, I'm going to study something. And, and it's typically great leaders or great companies. And so the woman's house I was staying at was a political operative. She was a speechwriter for George W. Bush. She was very, had lived a very fascinating life. And I was staying in her house. And so she had all these pictures of her and all the presidents. And she had a bookshelf that was like huge. I mean, like I was in heaven. I was, this is the coolest thing in the world. And, and, and what I began to study was great companies, Amazon, Airbnb. How did Uber go from where it was in 2010 to where it is today? Companies that are worth 30, 40, 50 billion dollars. Airbnb is worth 35 billion dollars and Marriott's only worth 20 billion. Now I want you to think about that. They don't own one location. Uber has the largest transportation company in the world and doesn't own one vehicle. So I started studying all of these companies and I started to say, what do they all have in common? And when you study their CEOs and the people that founded them, they all have one thing in common and that one thing is an absolute obsession with their customers. Am think about Amazon, Bezos and his obsession with the customer. There will be a time very soon where you order something on Amazon and a drone drops it off 30 minutes later at your house. You know that, right? That it will literally be that fast. When he says, I want to have the everything store, it's you will literally be able to buy everything at Amazon and it be there. He is obsessed with the customer. When they built Airbnb the first five years, if you don't know anything about Airbnb, it did nothing because they're going to open up your house to complete strangers. And people are freaked out about that, right? I'm not going to open up one of my bedrooms to a complete stranger while I'm here. So for the first five years, nothing. They started the company because one buddy's rent, they raised his rent 25% and he, and he couldn't pay for it. And the guy said, hey, just come here. You can sleep on an air mattress and I'll serve you breakfast. Air, bed, and breakfast. <laughs> now think about that. Nothing happens. They finally, when Obama was uh, being, uh, I think the inauguration or one of the big things that Obama was doing was in Denver and it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger for President Obama and they, and they finally took it to the stadium where they had 100,000 people at the stadium but Denver only had 20,000 hotel rooms. So they picked up their little business and went to Denver 
and they said, will you open up your house to let people stay here, right? And make it a good experience. Maybe even cook them a little breakfast, right? Air, bed, and breakfast. But then after that, the company went downhill because nothing. That was a one-time event. You, you follow me? And so these guys began to get coaching, <clears throat> and they only had a few customers in New York City, but they were in another part of the country. I think they were in California. And one of their coaches said, where are your customers at? He said, well, our customers are in New York City. And the coach said, go to New York City and spend time talking to your customers and ask them what they want and then respond to it. The very first thing they said is, hey, it'd be nice if we had a profile of these people. It'd be nice if we had a profile of these people so we knew who were coming to our house and we could get to know them before. And, and then they started to ask this question, what would give, why would a person give a five star? What would a five star experience look like? But that ain't the right question. The right question is not how can we make this experience better for you. The right question we're going to focus on today is how do we make this experience so strong that you will run and tell other people about it. You see the difference in the questions? See right now you do social survey. <clears throat> and I have noticed that the surveys are going up. Has this been a good thing or a bad thing? Yes or no? It's a good thing. Is it possible that some of those customers could give you fives and never go tell another person about you? Yes or no? Yes. So I want you to start distinguishing the difference between a promoter and an advocate. Okay? A promoter is a person when solicited says good things about you. Right? See, when Fred Reicheld, if you don't know where the net promoter concept came from, it came from Fred Reicheld who wrote a book called The Ultimate Question. And he said there's only two things you want to know when this experience is over. Anybody know what the two questions were? When the experience is over, he said there's only two things you need to know about this, exper about this experience. Anybody know what it was? On a scale of one to ten, how satisfied were you with this experience? One to four, they hated it. What did they used to say? Hated it. <laughs> four to seven, passives. That means they used you, but they most likely would not use you again. And they are definitely not referring you. And you have lost the lifetime referral of the customer. Passive. Right? Seven to ten, promoters. If asked, if solicited, they would say, yes, I would use them again. But is that really the type of customers that you want? No. Is that as far as it goes? Because I could give you all fives on the survey and still not ever have a conversation with one person about Churchill Mortgage. See, what the guys at Airbnb said, what would warrant a seven-star experience? Well, what would warrant a seven-star experience is if Matt Clark goes to Malibu and he wants to learn how to surf, okay? I'm getting a visual right now of you out there in the Pacific Ocean, right? If he goes to that house in Malibu in the profile when they're asking him questions and he goes to the same house that I went to, when he shows up at the house, number one, there's a person there to greet him and show him how to use the house properly, right? Number two, they give him a, a list of all the great restaurants in Malibu because he's never been to Malibu before. But that ain't the real kicker. To get a seven star or a ten star, they say, we noticed that you really want to try surfing, so we've got you two surfboards and a half day worth of lessons while you're here on us. And he goes, now that is a ten star experience. So when I went to that house, they had a person there to greet me. And they walked through the house and they showed me how to use the house properly, right? And they did most of the things that the founder said they should do. They didn't leave any gifts. But ideally, the founder said you should always leave a gift for a person that comes and stays at your house that is pertinent to them. So they designed this thing. And then and now there's some slippage because I'm sure you've stayed at Airbnb house that they didn't do those things. They didn't meet you there. They didn't greet you, right? Maybe it was a good experience. Maybe it wasn't. So, they, so in some places they do it really right. In some places they don't, right? But that's quickly become, become the deal. So for you... You've got to ask this question, how do we move to the next level? Not just a promoter. How do we use move to an advocate level? How many people here think that Churchill's losing money at the advocacy level of people referring? Raise your hand. Okay, now why do you think that is? Because when I look at the, uh, your you know, mortgage company, I obviously see places, just like in every company, that you, you're, lose, you're leaving money on the table. One is in follow-up. We know that, right? It's speed to follow-up. Speed to follow-up with opportunity going seven touches with a person that's interested. There's money being left on the table there, but there's also money being left on the table after the experience. Okay, so Doug, speak to that one for a second. Where do you think, where, how do you think we're, we're, we're leaving money on the table as a result of that advocate experience? Uh, just one thing would be that we don't do anything afterwards personally to reach out to them, like have a call with 
Okay. And that's what Howard Land does. So think about this. They tell us that 98% of real estate agents never call a customer back once they put them in a home. Although every real estate transaction should be worth 5.7 referrals. Okay, so I see lots of mortgage originators that focus solely on the real estate agent and they neglect the customer. <laughs> and they forget that the customer can be a huge referral source for them, right? What, right? Then I've got mortgage originators I coach that do customer appreciation events that have two and three hundred people at their customer appreciation events every time they do them. And it always includes the whole family. What do you think the referability rate is in those scenarios where they're getting their past customers to come to consistent customer appreciation events where two and three hundred people are coming, right? So, so one problem we're having in today is where A, we've gotten too busy being fabulous and what that means is we're so busy selling out the front windshield that we're losing all the money of the people we already sold to. So we're not optimizing the relationship. So this is a very, very big deal. Now, for, where does operations play into this? Operations plays into this in a lot of ways because the, uh, is that me right there? Okay. Um, I was like, man, I didn't put that in my slide. <laughs> 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 oh, the one-click wonder, that's part of the deal, right? I think I can figure out how to use it, but, but, but I didn't put it in there. So when you think about this, <clears throat> and I want to come back to this at the end, actually, um, here's the real question we should be asking. And I really, to, to, to be great with your current customers, you have to slow down. I want you to remember, slow down to speed up. Slow down to speed up. And I've actually been in a, in a, in a, in a highly charged debate with my own team. And my own team has actually disagreed with me about this. I think in the end I'm going to win. But I, here's what I said. I don't care if we're signing up 30 or 40 or 50 new customers every month. I want us to slow down and face-to-face -face onboard every single one of them. Here's their argument to me. Coach, we can't scale. We can't scale. We can't scale. You're not going to know every customer. I get it. But that customer needs to feel like they are important. They're not a number. You know when I worked in the prison system for four years? They became known as their numbers. They did not call them by their names. So they told, called a number and said, time to eat, time to do this, time to... They never called them by their name. They were just a number. You, you with me? And so here's what I'm telling my team. I don't care if we sign up 100 new customers. If you sell them, you spend 30 minutes with them on the front end, face-to-face -face or through Skype, and ask them key questions and get to know them and, and you mark it down that I said it. Our retention rate with those customers will go through the roof. Everybody with me? If we just slow down and spend 30 minutes with them face to face or via Skype and ask them key questions, watch and see what it does for our retention. They will not want to quit on us. They will be more likely to refer us. They will be more likely to fight for us faster. You, you follow me here? But everybody's got in such a hurry that we can't do it. So the, the, this is the wrong question. What can we do better? You may ask the customer, what can we do better for you? And you say, well, you could have done this better. You could have communicated with me better. You could have done this. That's not the right question. The right question is what? How, how good can we make it for you that you run and tell everybody else? How good can we make it for you that we run and tell everybody else? So if by and large, on a scale of the four types of customers, okay, I'm going to come back to this one. When you think about the four types of customers, which ones do you think you're building at Churchill? And we talked about this a lot, but this is, this is very important. Passive, detractor, promoter, advocates. What do you think you're building as it relates to the experience? Mostly number one. Say again? Mostly number one. Mostly number one, passives. Now, think about that. Let me give you another word for passive, lukewarm. <laughs> lukewarm. How do you feel about Churchill? When they do this, Take it or leave it. So I told you the company of the pool company, when I built one of my houses, I was the only person in the subdivision that put in a private swimming pool. And I actually told the builder I would not build in there unless I could have my own swimming pool. And, and they had to change the covenants because they had a community pool. And I said, well, if you want me to build in the subdivision, i got to have my own pool. Okay? I love all those kids in the subdivision, but I don't want to be over there swimming with them. Okay? I want some peace and quiet. So they changed the covenants and said, we'll let you have your own pool. Well, after I put a pool in, nine other people put a pool in. Nine. They all came up to my house and knocked on the door. What did they say? 
Can we look at your swimming pool? Sure. Then what they ask? Who put your pool in? Then they said the million dollar question, which is what? Would you use them again? Now, what do you think, if they'd done a poor job service to me, poor job communicate with me, if they halfway did the service, if, right? What do you think I said? Yeah. Hate to tell you, I just can't recommend them. So I was very passive, if not a detractor. Now let's say the average pool cost fifty to eighty thousand dollars, depending on how nice you go with it. And there were nine other pools. They all come and ask me how much money did they lose? Yeah. Let's call it a half a million dollars. Yeah. They lost a half a million dollars in revenue for that pool company in one little subdivision. They could have picked up a half a million. See, we don't think of customers like that. We think, well, they didn't like it, won't hurt us, because why, Matt? Because so much demand in the market right now, we can get them anywhere. You need to think of you just lost a half a million dollars. That could have been in your pocket. Everybody with me here? So you don't want to build a passive experience. You don't want to build a detractive experience where they're spreading negative comments about you and your brand. Okay? Some people go, well, they were just crazy or they were high maintenance or whatever the case. Listen, 10% of the total population just nuts. They are crazy. <laughs> Nothing you could do could make them happy. Right? Everybody? It's probably a low number. Okay? But my point is you don't want these people out there in the market. Right? Especially in localized markets. This is the worst thing in the world for mortgage people. People going out there and saying negative things. You can't deliver on time. Have you already went through one rebrand re of your reputation? Yes or no? Yes. I remember a time when people said negative things about Churchill. Every time I brought Churchill up, when I first started coaching in real estate, I heard negative, negative, negative. I'm like, man, what's going on over there? What is going on? Why are so many people saying negative things? Did it have to do with turn times? Did it have to do with they couldn't deliver on time? What, what did it have to do? But here's the deal. I wasn't hearing positive things. Now I hear positive things. You, you follow me here? So you've worked on and rebuilt that reputation. We've all probably had to rebuild our reputation at some point, right? And many times, how do we get reputation? This audience participation part. How do we get reputation? We earned it, didn't we? Every bad reputation I ever got, I earned it. I didn't deliver on something I promised. I didn't follow through. I earned that reputation. You with me? So now you have a very strong reputation, but it can get better, right or wrong? And it can get better because of understanding this. We want to become obsessed with the customer experience because we understand these four types of customers. So let's just say right now you're building passive. It could be because why? Why do you think we're building passive? No, Doug said no follow-up after the experience. What else? Lack of communication. Lack of communication. Yes? I, th I think that it's, it's still hard to differentiate um, us from being a commodity. Yes. So it's that we're not different. Right. So, and, so many of our loans are transactional versus relational. Mm -hmm. And because of that, nobody, all the things we've said, are not following up and trying to stay in touch with people, so there's no impression. That's right. Just remember, I am not a transaction. My daughter's four years old, and sometimes she'll say, Daddy, I'm a real human being. I'm like, I know that, sweetheart. <laughs> but, but, but I'm like, right? This customer is a real human being. They got real problems, real issues, they got real things. And what you don't want, here, I guess here's what I want to make an impression on you today is you don't, this does you no good. This is a one time and done. Never come back. Not only do you lose the 5.7 referrals, you lose the lifetime of the customer most likely, right? Okay? And most stats are four to, four to eight times they're going to buy a house in the future, but there's a lot of referral building, there's a lot of communication, there's a lot of just positive goodwill. Okay? You don't want these, and you're going to get some if, if you don't deliver, right? But you really got to be very poor for a person to go out there and really say negative things about you, don't they? Okay, last night we were late on a lot of flights and I, a woman come off one of those planes in Southwest. She said, I will never, ever fly Southwest again. All right? I'm like, there ain't no first class on Southwest, hon. No. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You're going to get your peanuts and most of the time they get you there on time and that's it, okay? But you paid for that, right? You paid a cheaper fare for that. Well, in her mind, she walked over there mad enough that she would just tell everybody around her. I'm never flying Southwest again, okay? I didn't like it, bad experience, whatever the case may be. That's a detractor. What if she goes back and tells 10 people? What if she gets on Facebook and tells people? What if she got, you see what I'm saying here? So, so promoters are this, and it looks like on a lot of your surveys, you are getting to this point, right or wrong. So don't beat yourself up too bad. 
you are getting here, but where I want to get you is here. And here is, I am actively fighting for you right now in the market and you don't even know it. Like there's a conversation going on right now about somebody buying a house and where they're going to do the mortgage and, and somebody's out there fighting for you and you don't even know it. And that phone call's coming into you. What if you had 25 of those? What if every uh, home loan specialist here had 25 of these? That was sending them three referrals a year. That was 75 new deals a year just through 25 people. Is that something that you think is feasible? Yes. So even if you have 300 customers or help 600 people this year, surely to goodness you can get 25 of them that say this was one of the best experiences of my life. And so here's what I got to ask you. Um, what, what is the payoff for you? And I'm going to have you talk about this right here. Like I was thinking about why would you be customer obsessed? <coughs> like what's in it for you, right? Like what's your payoff here? Why would an op when I speak to the operations team next, what, what, would, what would make an operations person really, really think about the end customer, just thinking about getting a file from here to there. I mean really think about doing it right and serving that customer. What, what, what is it? So I came up with these reasons. For some people, they're going to say, look, the payoff for me is the more cu customer focused I am, the more money we're going to make. Right? The more money we're going to make. When they asked the, the CEO of Uber, when he went to China and tried to bring Uber to China, they kept asking him, what's your strategy, what's your strategy? And he said, hey, if we just serve these people a whole lot better than anybody else has, we'll make a lot more money. Right or wrong? If we just serve these people better than the taxi cabs have, we will make a lot more money. This is kind of my stance. We'll make a lot more money when we get our clients to a much better place. You follow me here? If you just become totally obsessed, okay? So one could be money, but maybe for you, okay? Is it satisfaction? Some of you are motivated by progress and the completion of something. You know, so, I, so it's like, hey, I got this ball across the finish line. I was an important part of this. Is it affirmation? Do you need to be told? Now, here's what I would tell you. The, the more big time you get, don't take offense to this, the less I think you need to be told how good you are. When I get around big time people and I, I see people give them compliments, you, you know what big time people do? They're like, thank you. Because they've heard it all, right? They don't get fed by you telling them how good they are. They know they're good. Right? So you, you watch them, they're just like, okay, thanks. I appreciate it. And you're like, man, I just told you you was like the best thing in the world. Well, they've been, how many times have they been told that? That don't feed them. They're, so they start getting to a point where that's like, okay, thank you. But do you know whether you're good or not? Yes or no? Do you know whether you're clicking on all cylinders today? Yes or no? Do you need anybody else to tell you? Like when I go home, my wife don't know if I reach my potential today or not. I do. She don't know what my potential is. My own mother don't know what my potential is. So it doesn't feed, you don't have to tell me and give me feedback. And, and, and to me, I think people that need that all the time, I constantly have to tell you how good you are. I constantly got to tell you, I'm like, come on, man. You know if you're good. You don't need validation from me, right? So think about that. But maybe affirmation is yours. But what about this one? What if you start getting fed by the transformation of how you get other people to a much better place in their life? And that feeds you. That, this is the number one thing that feeds you is, man, I took, I took something that was here and got it to here, right? And that is, is worth it. So I want you to stop right now and I want you to tell the person around you, what's the number one thing that would feed you personally on this customer obsession piece? Like why, how could I drill this into you? You go, I'm going to be customer obsessed because of these reasons, okay? Take a second and tell the person beside you. That's a great one. Legacy. Yeah, that's a great one. Which that would probably not be as much for like me. No, 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 like no, no, no. I think being part of something bigger is part of it. Is that? It, it could be, be you, you could add it up there. It's part of transformation. Yeah. Who wants the founder, by the way? What'd you think? 
You know, he was kind of a slimy guy. Yeah, he was. So kind of like, okay, the horse is wide, and kind of, That's right. kind of mixed, you know? Like, well, what I was more interested in was the business, yeah. scalability, no, definitely. the, the symphony the symphony of efficiency. It seems like those symphonies <coughs> below that are driven like that, the personal lines kind of fall apart a little bit. I've seen that. Totally agree. Just listen to the guy this morning who did uh, five guys uh, kind of had a bad personal life. I ain't heard that story. I hadn't heard that one. What is it? It's called How I Built This. No, I hadn't heard that one. He interviews Airbnb guys. He interviews everybody. I okay. Mean, I'll show it to you. Yeah, I need to. How I Built This. Okay. Okay. All right. These guys asked me to add one, and I think it's worth it. What about being part of a story of building something special? Does that motivate you? Yeah. As long as money's involved. As long as money's involved. Okay. <laughs> hey, did you say that out loud? Oh, <laughs> Too bad for churches. <laughs> <laughs> Remember what Steve Jobs said to John Scully when he was trying to get Scully to leave Pepsi and come to Apple? Is he took a walk with him because Scully was kind of balking. And he looked at him and said, you can go back and sell sugar water for the rest of your life and make a fortune doing it if that's what you want to do. Or you can come to Apple and you can help us change the world. Isn't that a great closing line? Yeah. Turned out to be a bad hire because he turned around and fired jobs. But, <laughs> but, but that's the line he used. You can sell sugar water if that's what you want to do. That's what your legacy is going to be. Or you can come to Apple and help us change the world. Right? Now, go ahead. A friend of mine told me when he was interviewing with Bear Bryant mm -hmm. for uh, to play for him or not, he was looking at that at Auburn, and uh, Bear Bryant said, you would want to play for a championship, play with us. Otherwise, you're going to play with the other team. Yeah, that's right. So, so think about this. You, you can say to other people, you can sell mortgages if that's what you want to do, which is just a manufactured product pushed through an assembly line that is then sold to the market to solve a problem. Yeah. Right? Or you can come to Churchill and build something special. Everybody follow me here? But there actually has to be something special at Churchill to be able to say that. Right? That's culture. That's people. That's transformation. That's getting people to a better place in their life. We're not just selling a manufactured product around here. We're doing something special. We're changing the world. Okay? This is how we're going to do it. Okay? Because I guarantee you I go to a lot of other places. They don't have all the stuff on the walls and they don't even bring their... People, I was telling Eric this morning, he's new to my team, and today's his first day with me, and I said, man, you're going to see a place that is committed to culture. I'll take you to other places where you ain't going to see that. I'm going to try to beg them to get excited about their culture. You follow me here? You're going to see a place that's special. You need to see this. It's good for you to see on your first day and your first stop because it ain't always going to be like this, okay? So, so you got to decide what motivates you. So here, here would be the question is no amount of customer service training will take a disengaged worker and make them give great service. Do you believe that? Yeah. So if you're disengaged with your work, and a lot of people have an adversarial relationship with their work, or it's just a job, or they're just trying to make it through the day, no amount of training or coaching is going to take that person and make them give an unbelievable customer experience and be obsessed with the culture. Okay? So at first, don't you think first takes a kind of obsessed people that are obsessed about something in a good way because obsession can be negative or positive, right? Okay? Then, and, and then, so, so is this your work or is this a distribution channel for your talent? That's what I'd ask you. Is this just a job to you or do you feel like you're distributing your talent to the world through this work? And, and, then, and then you're getting rewarded. How do you get rewarded? Love, money, recognition, affirmation, referrals, rep, you, you with me? You get paid in six ways. You don't just get paid in money. But the people who are really good at what they do typically make a lot more money because they're distributing their talents at a very high level. Okay? I was on that plane last night trying to catch some of that Predators game. My first thought was, man, there's going to be a lot of people lay out of work tomorrow. That's the first thing I thought. <laughs> going to be a lack of productivity in Nashville tomorrow, isn't there? <laughs> but you're here, right? There may be a lot of missing people out there. <laughs> okay. 
But my point is, are, aren't we seeing when we see people, whether you're watching the NBA or the NHL, aren't we seeing people distribute their talent at the highest level possible when you get to this level, yes or no? Yes. You got to admire people distributing their talent that they have honed and refined and nurtured for years at the very highest levels. And they're getting rewarded. Look at how they're getting rewarded and just love in Nashville. Just appreciation. Just, that's just affirmation. Just thank you for doing this. Thank you for being, right? Okay, so this is important, okay? So remember this, customer obsession. Money changes hands when? When problems are solved. That's why selling is easy. There's a lot of problems in the world. If you work backward from what the customer actually wants. So what is it the customer actually wants? After the mortgage experience is over, what do they want? Give me, give me just a few big things. I've done four mortgages in my life. What did I want? Whitney, what do you think they want? After, after the experience is over, we're working backward from, from the end. I think, I think they want to know that, that they really still matter no matter what, that they continue to be on your radar and that, they, that you're never going to lose sight of them and that mm -hmm. you're always going to be there as a guide to get them when they need them or, and proactively in some cases. That's right. If someone sees a, something ahead, an opportunity ahead, that you're looking out for that person. Yes. Think about a, a trusted advisor in your life that you call on on a frequent basis. Do you know one of the number one reasons I call him my mortgage person? He's great with percentages. He understands how things work. And I'll say, break this, break this deal down for me and help me to understand it. I'm thinking about buying a place in Seaside, Florida to do these retreats I'm doing because I'm doing these retreats in Seaside now and they're very lucrative because everybody wants to go to Seaside and I can do the coaching at the ocean. And so I'm like, maybe I want to buy a house down there, rent it out, and then do 10 retreats a year. And those weeks could be worth 50 or 60,000 to me to go down to Seaside and do what I love doing at a cool place with cool people. And so I'm like, help me work through this. So then he just sits there and works through the numbers and he comes back and says, and he does the whole thing. Like you can rent it, here, I've done the research, here's how much you can rent it for, here's how much positive cash flow you'll bring in. Then I got done, he's like, do you want a partner? Can I be a partner? <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, he's much more than a person that I go through when I just buy a house. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're having regular conversation on a weekly, monthly basis about about real estate and mortgages and deals and so see he's a trusted advisor think you got a, a doctor a lawyer you got an advisor that is always there in your life that you're called that's how a mortgage experience should be it's like I'm here with you and anytime anything comes up around this arena you're gonna call me it's not a one-time and done deal and that's how a lot of people approach it and he takes care of you even if you're not doing a deal that's exactly right That's right. Yeah, and I call those people climbers in the selling system. A climber is a person that can't do something today but can do something in the future. You with me? So a, a lot of times people will reach out to me on Facebook that I don't know, and the fact that I reach back out to them, they end up buying something from our store. Like I'll reach back out to them and say, hey, and that was like, I can't get in your big coaching program, but you took enough time to call me and talk to me and have, or at least send me something back. And then they'll go right online and buy something. Buy a book. You, you, were you with me? So it's just the act of kind of helping another person, okay? So work backward from that, okay? Think about that Airbnb. What would give us a seven-star experience? If on, the, if on the social survey that you're using there was a seven versus just a five, what if there's a category that said, hey, this person over-delivered, I, I can't even get it on this thing. Right, Lawson? I can't even get it, I can't even get it on this survey, what I want to say about this person, okay? And, and then think about Amazon's obsession with the customer, okay? Now... How do you build advocates? So if we're working backward from this experience, you're telling me that right now we feel like we're building two types of customers. Not necessarily detractors, <coughs> but we're building passives and promoters, right? So if I said we're going to implement an advocate strategy and we're going to go to work on building an advocate, what would you do to build an advocate? Okay, now there's two, two ways. What I see with a lot of LOs, their advocacy is built totally on their personality. They have great charisma, great people, know how to say the right thing, know how to love on people, but is that sustainable? You really want to build an advocate based on systems, customer touch points, right? Customer touch points, not on a personality of one person. 
if you do it right. It's, it's like I went through this little greatness factory and man, it was great. And every part of it was great and every person was great. Because here's one thing I do. So a lot of times when I've dealt with the loan originator, they were really good, but I dealt with their team and they were not very good. They didn't pay attention. They wasted my time. They asked for the same things over and over. You see what I'm saying? Does that hurt the overall experience? Yes or no? Yes. I'm dealing with your team. So your team is a reflection of you. So untrained people drastically hurt this experience. Untrained people drastically hurt this experience. Okay? Okay? Meaningful moments along the customer journey. What, what is the meaningful moment along the customer journey right now? And do you think it's consistent across the board at Churchill? It's probably what I suspect that there's pockets of greatness. There's probably some branches and some people that do it great and there's meaningful moments and then there's some people that do it awful. And it's very, it's very inconsistent. Okay, now how does that hurt the overall brand of Churchill? It hurts you because Churchill's a brand, right? Churchill's a brand, okay? Now I have a philosophy of over-promising and trying to over-deliver. This, this is a scary one. This is a scary one. Because the first thing everybody says is what? Let's under-promise and over-deliver. What if we could get to the place where we said let's over-promise and over-deliver? <laughs> Hadn't sold you on that one, have I? Everyone's like, well, I don't know on this. Why not? Why not? I tell my salespeople, overpromise. And let's overdeliver. If you're good, you're good. So whatever we're doing, add something to it. Whatever we're doing, add add more to it. You follow me here? Plus one. Okay? And don't, and don't get caught up in all the little things. Plus one. Our ultimate goal should be to get the client to a much better state. Okay, get them to a much better state. State Farm used this for years. Let's get you to a much better state. Here's the problem. Their agents didn't actually call their customers. So the number one complaint they had is, hey, you trying to get me to a better state, but I hadn't heard from you in three years. How are you going to get me to a much better state? You see, you, you see that? Last night when I was in uh, St. Louis at the airport, all the flights were delayed, and all of their, all, think about your problem that you've got, all of the restaurants were overcapacitated with not enough servers. So nobody could eat because they had three restaurants. And so they were walking up and down saying, will you leave Chili's and go down here to this restaurant because I think they can serve you faster. And I said, well, I was just down at that restaurant and nobody had any food on their table. And I need to eat. And that's a pretty good indication something ain't working right. And they said, I promise you, if you'll just go down here. And I go down there and they got one server and one bartender in the whole place. But they had a button. Now this is the irony that I want you to get away from. They had a button on every table that said for, for quick and speedy service, push this button. <laughs> and I was like, hey, hey. See how, see how comical that is? They got a button that says for speedy service, push here, but they got one person servicing all those customers. You, you understand what I'm saying? And this is how a lot of companies do it. Okay? So you can't over it. So, so understand this. Here's where I think you build advocacy. You don't build advocacy in a product, do you? Because the product is a commodity. So where do you build advocacy in? You understand intangibles. What is an intangible? <laughs> How would you describe an intangible? Something I can't measure. Something I can't measure. You know the intangible I felt when I was in Phoenix, Arizona at that branch? Intensity. Kind of freaked me out a little bit. I know they're watching. But I loved it. Like in a good way. It was like an intensity that I liked. You know what I'm saying? I'm like engaged. I'm like these people are serious about their business. Right Lawson? So these people are serious about their business, and I loved it. I love people that are serious. And they were like, like debating with me, arguing with me about the EOS, how to use it. And they're like, does this offend you, Coach Burt? And I'm like, no. It shows me you're engaged. You don't have to believe everything Coach Burt says. Challenge, push back. Let's have some dialogue about it, right? It was, it was fun, right? Then we took pictures together, hugged it out, moved on to the next place. <laughs> Right? Like, can we take pictures together? Yeah. But my point is, 
at least they were at least they're alive. You understand what I'm saying? They're alive and engaged, man. Dynamic. I loved it. And I and I love both places. And you know, first place I was just too sick to love that place, but 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 <laughs> my my but I loved it. I did. So my point is here's what I can feel. I can't measure it, but I can feel it. Any great coach, Eric coached at Ole Miss. Um, and, and he's been at the highest levels of coaching, he would tell you that the way you win games is through intangibles. Intangibles are things we can't measure, but, and they never show up on a, on a score sheet, but they're there. Trust, chemistry, buy-in, leadership, belief. See, with your customers, assets add. I'm adding something to your life you don't have, not just the mortgage. Okay, so what am I doing? I can make you money, I can save you money, that's good, make you time, save you time. I can create energy or subtract energy from you, right or wrong. Okay, um, Matt talks about leaving every person in a much better place through one conversation with them. Okay, I can anticipate or I can react. I can listen to your needs. You know what most people do when you give them feedback about their customer service? What do they do? Their defense attorney shows up. <laughs> they get defensive. You know what Airbnb guy said? Listen and respond. Listen and react. Don't listen and get defensive. Listen and react to what your customers are telling you. Okay, and, and here's what I would tell you. They're telling you slow down to speed up because invisible assets is actually how you build advocacy. It's like I got a little, I got a little meter inside of me, and, you know, I call it a BS meter, you know. I can kind of tell if you're not the real deal or not. And I can kind of tell if you're willing to fight for me or not. I can kind of tell if we're in this together or not, right? It's, it's a little indicator, and it, it's invisible, but I can feel it, right? So these are all intangible assets that you can add to the equation. So think about this version of what we're implementing is when you get a new customer, slow down, spend time with the customer, even if it's 20 or 30 minutes, right? Have conversation and dialogue. Ask them key questions and see if that doesn't help your retention. See if it doesn't help the trust because it will definitely help the trust. Now, where do we break down on this? I would ask you guys this question. Matt talked about when we get you to a better place, when we feed our sheep, our sheep are a whole lot better to go out there and feed the customer, right or wrong? That's what we're trying to do is feed into you. But here's where we break down. We break down we begin to give crumbs to each other. And you know one reason we give crumbs to each other is because we become too familiar with each other. And there's not a level of seriousness about what we're doing anymore. And I make, and, and, and so I actually said this to my team yesterday. This is not a suggestion. Like, I'm not asking you for what you think about this. I've heard what you thought. I've made my decision. This is how we're going to onboard our customers. This is a directive. It's not, a, it's not open for any more discussion. I have made this decision. This is what we're going to do. Move on. Execute it, right? Because here's what I see. There's a lot of suggestions that happen every day that nobody goes and does. Everybody with me? Well, we need you to read emails, but you don't read the emails. So you don't know what's going on. I said we're going to implement this policy in our company and you just kind of halfway listen it so you don't do it in your branch because you think your branch is somehow special compared to the other branches. And I'm on the other side of this. Like I'm sitting with the CEOs and I'm seeing them tell people to go do things and they don't go do it. And I'm asking why? Why don't, why don't you go do what that person's asking you to do? It's not a suggestion. They're telling you go implement it. Go do it. Okay? Well, What happens is we become too familiar with each other. And because we're so familiar, we let our guard down, and we start giving crumbs to each other. Then you know what suffers? The customer experience suffers, right or wrong. We said do the file correctly and pass it on correctly. Don't halfway do it, but you still halfway do it. Why? Who suffers? The customer, which is the one paying your salary, by the way. Churchill Mortgage doesn't pay you any money. It's just a conduit between the customer and you. That's the person you've got to become obsessed with, right? So when we get too relaxed with each other, I just call giving it crumbs to each other, what actually happens is it affects the customer experience because we're not tight enough in our execution because people just out there just kind of doing their own thing and it's not working, okay? And, and everybody's got to get better at that, okay? So where do you think we break down here? This is the point where you tell me. You think it's lack of accountability, lack of pro process, lack of follow through? Some of it is lack of accountability. Okay. Now, when you say accountability, un, uh, explain that to me. What are you, how are you saying it? Well, you have, you have your different departments, and if one department is responsible for you know, making sure the, the documents are there and verified, 
-hmm. and they're not looking at it, they're just putting the paper through, they're not being accountable for, for what right. they're missing. That's right. And that's going to cause a breakdown when it gets to the next department. That's right. And then what happens after that? It just continues. Somebody's got to pick up the pieces somewhere, right. but along the line, the customer is the one suffering because it's going to delay, and the customer is going to get frustrated. Yep. And typically, what ensues after that? I get mad at everybody. Yeah, Mag gets mad at everybody. <laughs> but that is after. That's hey, hey, he he gets mad at everybody after he's heard <laughs> ten rounds of complaining. Because at the end of the day, I don't care whose fault it was. I think we're all responsible for picking up the pieces before the customer that experiences compromise. That's the whole idea behind the room sweep. Yeah. If there are crumbs, sweep them up. Yeah. I think too, though, you have to, the leadership has to be a lot more accountable of making their people accountable because if you're always covering up and, and making it happen for them, it's going to keep they're going to keep doing the bad stuff. They're going to keep doing yeah. whatever the, the mistake is if you keep covering up for them. You gotta so serve the customer right. and fix the right. problem. Absolutely. Right. But you can't do you can't just do one. Right, you have to do both. Because one's not good enough. Now, when we studied the five dysfunctions, anybody remember the fifth dysfunction of teams? Because we've given you a lot of stuff over the last two years. <laughs> anybody remember the fifth dysfunction? Many of y'all read the book? Fifth dysfunction is status and ego. And you know what status and ego says? I'm bigger than the whole. So I don't have to do it right because I'm more important than everybody else. What are they going to do? Fire me? Bobby Knight actually suffered from this one. And they fired him in Indiana. And then they went to a national championship game. So he thought that they couldn't live without him. Right? So what happens is the way this plays into these dysfunctions is when I don't address this, we have fear of conflict which is a second dysfunction, which produces artificial harmony, which means we're kind of living in fairy tale land, right? Because I can't address it. Everybody follow me here? And I can't address it because your status has gotten too big. Now, what that builds is an undercurrent of resentment from other people. They don't say it, but you feel it. So people begin to resent each other. So what happens as a result of somebody not turning the file in correctly, because I'm giving you crumbs, is you begin to resent me, right? But you don't say it because i got a fear of conflict. And it's a cycle. It's a cycle. So, go ahead. You're good. In between, because the process and accountability, if they were kind of more linear process, then there would be accountability. But there's like one piece that would be missing if you, you know, throw in there, and that's the standard of excellence. Because mm -hmm. you can't hold them accountable unless you have a standard of that's excellence. That's right. So that's the one part that I think sometimes when we look at that accountability and the process, sometimes we hold people accountable to a process that lacks a standard of excellence. Okay. And that's what the whole thing starts going down. I got you. Because they don't know exactly what is the thing we're trying to attain. Yeah. Well, and you said the key word. If I'm going to hold you accountable, my first question is, what am I holding you accountable to? I like holding people accountable to system, process. Because it's not personal. It's not whether I like you or don't like you. We have a process that you're supposed to go by, right? And when you don't, when, when the inputs are correct in the process, the output should be correct. Everybody follow me here? We know what our end output is, and that is trying to get these loans finished seven day clear to close. Right? Because what we believe, and we believe that every person deserves the right to have their, right? Loan closed early or on time with little or no stress. So as we input these inputs, the, the output should be correct. So what I'm really holding you accountable to is not your personality or whether you showed up with a smile on the day. Your, what I'm holding you accountable to is are you doing this excellent? Are you handing it from here to here to here to here like it should be handled? And that's accountability and process and follow through. Okay? All right, so let's, let's, let's put a bowl around this because we've got five minutes. Here's the ultimate goal of this. <coughs> the ultimate goal is to come out with 25, a minimum, in my opinion, every loan originator here should come out with a minimum of 25 advocates. 
These are 25 stark, raving, crazy fanatics. I believe those 25 people will send them qu three qualified referrals a year, and I believe they'll get 75 new deals a year out of those 25 people, and everybody can make a lot of money with just 25 people. How many people believe that? Now, we go into every customer experience, suspect to prospect, prospect to client, client to promoter, promoter to advocate. We go into every one trying to build that advocacy because we're fighting for you. But what if we're not fighting for each other? So if we're not fighting for each other, we can't go fight, right? There's enough competition out there. We, we don't need to be fighting against each other back here. We got to go fight people out there. So let's, let's, let's fight for each other. No crumbs. So here's our commitment from today. No crumbs from this point forward with each other. If, right? No crumbs. And if somebody's giving you crumbs, you need to call them on it. <laughs> Hey, you're giving me crumbs here to work with. We're going to get customer obsessed. We're going to become so obsessed, right? Because we're going to fight for our customers and they're going to fight for us. We're going to pick up all that money we're leaving on the table. Okay? That's what you got to walk out of here doing. Customers are messy, unpredictable, high maintenance, low maintenance, crazy. Don't matter. You know which ones I like? The ones that pay their bills. There used to be a country music song, Big, Little, or Short, or Tall, Wish I Could Have Kept Them All. I loved them, every one. I love every one of our customers. Don't you? Every single one of them. It doesn't matter high maintenance, low maintenance, no maintenance. I love them. Because they are the ones that allow us to do what we do every day. You follow me? So we're going to walk out here being more obsessed than we were before. And if you're not, you're probably not going to work well at Churchill, just to be honest with you. Because there's going to become a point with, with some people, Matt's going to say, look, I ain't listening to this anymore. Right? I ain't listen to this. You've been coached for years on what to do. <laughs> Go do it. Quit whining. I, I had a little post yesterday I was going to post. The amount of time we spent whining, complaining, or arguing, we could have, how much could we have already done? How much could we have already got done if we just cut out all this stuff, right? So let's look at these numbers. All right, talk, talk to me a little bit about these numbers. I don't like when it goes downward. <laughs> What do you think is happening? We're getting busier. Okay, so, so look where we started. Here's the good news, right? Progress. Started at 5 and 18, got as high as 81 and 45. Okay, so here's one of our high points. Here's another high point right here. Okay, now we're looking at May 67.33. Okay. If I was a coach, <laughs> you know what I'd be saying? We got to get better. We got to get better. Hey, this ain't going the way I need it to go, right? So you say, somebody said we got busy, and that's why you see a downward trend. Is that, everybody agree with that? Matt, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I think that's a reasonable excuse. Right? But that's wasn't all it is. Wasn't our top peak in March of last year one of our busiest months? It was. So, so that can't be our answer then. Yeah. Focus. So you got... Okay, all right. So, you went more refinance. That's right. That year. Exactly. And so you had time uh, because of the refinance and versus the purchase industry right now. So you're saying the refis padded the numbers? Yes. Because well, the you refis, you don't have to schedule them until you have a clear to close. And if you schedule them a week out, you're good. On a purchase, you get a hard, you get a hard date. So I think we're doing I'll take the refis out. I think we're doing fine, but here's a reality. What does it do to your referability when you have a purchase cleared to close a week in advance? Yep. And, then you, and then you spend that week build an advocate. That's right. That's the goal. The goal is not to come into the closing table on two wheels because we got it done just in time. The goal is take a deep breath, have the clear to close, and have a few days to build advocates. Yep. Nothing thrills a realtor like, do you want to close early? Yep. Yeah. When you get around big time people, I use this with Michael Brown's team this morning, when you get around really, really big time people, one thing I've noticed is that they're very seldom in a hurried state. They have the ability to be totally present. Right? They're not, they don't live in an agitated state. They figured out how to master their feelings, their moods. And when you're with them, they're very present with you. 
You follow me? Almost like they're relaxed. <laughs> it's like the world around them is moving fast, but they're just cool, you know? And they, almost every big time person I get around is like that. Mike Hardwick's like that. It's very cool, very calm. He's a good looking dude too, you know? I like that. I mean, he's, he's, just a, he's just a cool dude. And I mean that with the utmost respect. What I mean by it is every time I'm around him, he's in a very relaxed state. He can have total conversation with you. Does that make sense? <coughs> he, do, he doesn't seem to live in an agitated state. When I get around a lot of big time people, that's how they, that's how they are, right? When I'm around people that are not producing high levels, they live in a constant, agitated, <coughs> rolling on two wheel state. You, you know what I mean? And there's a different level of presence about them. One makes you feel comfortable, relaxed. I can trust this person. One makes you feel like, hey, do you have yourself together here? Rolling in on two wheels does not make me feel good about this. And you may think, well, we've got it across the finish line. You ought to pat us on the back. The customer does not care how you got it across the finish line. <coughs> they care about how you made them feel. When I'm with you, I feel better about me. You with me? That's it. So we'll go to work on this, okay? We're going to bring an operations team next, and everybody's, in, everybody's involved with this, okay? Not just sales, and everybody is. And then here's the numbers of the branches. Anybody know the question I always ask here? How do you feel about your, where you're sitting? And if you don't like it, what are you willing to change, right? How do you feel about where you are in relationship to your goals? Your, notice I said your goals. Okay. All right, if you don't like where you're sitting, hey, <laughs> right? Something's got to move, something's got to change, right? What got us here won't get us there. That's what you always got to remember, okay? So we're going to walk out here today, be more obsessed with the customer. You think we'll make a lot more money, yes or no? Yes. More obs obsession with the customer, I'm telling you. This is where it's at, guys. This is where it's going, okay? Thank you for today. Thank you for being coachable, guys. Bless you.